This is Off Planet Radio. Hey everybody, welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I am Emily Moyer and I'm flying solo today. And we have an interesting show that is more of what I kind of want to get into doing with this. And that is interesting conversations with people that I really like as opposed to formal interview, structured interview kinds of things. So I've done a lot of this, but this will be kind of, I've kind of pulled away from that recently with some of the other things that we've been doing. And I want to kind of really start getting into that. And some of that's going to be having conversations in the future. Some of it may even be having conversations with people from our Patreon group, which these two, although they are known on the alternative media, they have, you know, been interviewed by Freeman and several times by my friend Robert Phoenix. Uh, they also are part of our Patreon group where lots of interesting things go on and lots of uh, ideas and conversations are sort of gestated and whatnot. So we're going to continue that today. And so my very special guests are Chris and Steve Creamy, Steve being the author of Catabatic Winds, which he just sent me and I've started reading, but it takes me forever to get through books these days. But um, they speak on a variety of topics, and uh, I think we're going to have some interesting conversations. So, Chris and Steve, welcome to Off Planet Radio for the first time. Thank you for being hey, here. Hey, thanks, Emily. Thanks, it's Emily. It's so great to be here. It's been, uh, yeah, we've been watching you guys for a while, and it's a real treat. Awesome. So, yeah, yeah so we, you know, you've been coming to our group for a little bit now, and just, I felt some little spark come between us, you know, happen between us in the last, in the last group, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I want to talk to these guys. And so we had a conversation last week that I, I cut short because it was so good and there were so much juicy nuggets in there that I didn't want to ruin some of the spontaneity so we could bring it over here. So I decided, you know, I need to go back and listen to the, some, some of the stuff they've done because I'm mostly aware of you guys from Robert talking about you and I, and I just haven't had a lot of time to consume a lot of media in the last couple of years. So you've been in the group and I had sort of an intuitive I'm pretty good with my intuition awareness of the kind of things you guys like to talk about and sort of, you know, what you're genre of discussion might be but i had this thing i'm like i'm gonna go listen to something they've done with robert and for some reason i felt like a long time ago when you first started going on the show with him you guys maybe had done the show about tavistock and tavistock plays a huge a huge role in, in my life for a number of reasons maybe we'll get into some of them even here but i was like i'm gonna go look for that one and then i saw that it was just a month ago and i was like how is that possible i felt like <laughs> that seemed to me like i had seen that like more than a year ago or like a year when you guys first started doing the regular once a month with Chris, I mean, with, uh, with Robert, I was, I had swore I had seen that. And I was like, how is that even possible? Which brings up lots of questions of time. And yeah. so, you know, and, and then, and then what's even more fascinating that I didn't expect is in the show where you're talking about Tavistock, you're running the movie Bluebird in the background. Oh, that was, that was right. I think that was our favorite which I had no idea existed as a movie and that, that I had no idea that uh, that was probably the, the genesis of Project Bluebird and yeah. that yeah. Bl Project Bluebird, of course, was one of the original works of Tavistock. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and that was Robert's idea to run that. And I think that was pure genius. That, that just really underscored because the visual is so important in our society. I'm going to have to, yeah, I'm going to have to go back and watch it because I was mostly listening. I mostly listen to information these days because I usually do it in my commute to and from work. I did look up, peek over every time I would hear one of you guys make an interesting comment about it. I'd sort of, you know, pull it up and, and take a look. But, um, you know, it's, it, it's so interesting the, the way that this bluebird theme has really woven through. I mean, we are now a society run by Twitter whose insignia is a bluebird. Right, and you have this uh, kind of situation where people make uh, these have they make statements that have to be a how many hundred and something characters or less, right. Right. right? right, and then you know it seems like the most important thing in the world. Well, that's the hot topic on Twitter, and then shortly after that, it's forgotten about, and that mm -hmm. is really what Bluebird was about was creating amnesia, right, mm -hmm. in, in the society. So it's so interesting that like we really have you know. And have, you know and, and and as a culture, Westerners are they access information um, visually, not ver not verbally, not mm -hmm. auditorily. Mm -hmm. You know, so like in India, I think that's more of an auditory uh, access. Traditional, mm -hmm. you know, 
yeah, in those traditional cultures. So their chanting would be a repetitious chanting, and so yeah. that's how they would have their memorization programs. Mm -hmm. But in the West, I think we're more oriented to vision. Yeah, I know I am. Mm -hmm. I, hold on to, I mean, like, okay, I heard it, but can I see that? I really need to see that and read it. And mm -hmm. if someone's putting something up on the screen and they're, even if they're putting it up on the screen and reading it, but it's on a video and it's flying too fast, I have to stop it, mm -hmm. go back and read it slowly so it seeps in. Otherwise, it just skims on the top and I can't grasp it. So that's really interesting. One of the things already, this is going nowhere I thought it would go. So I love it. <laughs> so yeah. one of the things I think we've been taken away from just in our evolution or de-evolution, our programming and the way our, you know, the root, sacred roots of our culture have been it disappeared from us is I think that it used to be a more common thing for people to have synesthesia. And now yes. it's considered a rare condition. Okay. And I have synesthesia. So for me, like, yeah, I like, I like visuals, but visuals, I'm more interested in the ones that are with my eyes shut, which I think uh -huh. actually some of these cultures that are more auditory, like India, because a lot of times when you're listening to things, you close your eyes, so you start to experience your inner cymatics. So it's a different kind of visual if there is visual there. But if you think about it, probably cultures that are largely, largely revolved around cuisine, like French, Italian, they're, they're, a lot of their thought stuff comes through their nose or their taste buds. And olfactory, right? Right, and olfactory. Yeah, and there's, I love that term, the perfume of memory, right? So mm -hmm. for a lot of people, nostalgia and, and all that is associated with smells. I seem, I, I've always seemed to be sort of equally um, moved by by those the different senses but i also and i don't know if this comes i don't know if this comes from projects and programming or if this is why they want to use you in projects and programming but i'll have that experience like when i'm at a party and the music is really good where i can almost smell the techno right i can see huh. it has a color to me it has a shape it has and it all starts to sort of become you know blended into you know one extra sensory kind of experience huh. Um, and I, I, it is interesting just the way they've mm, divided our brains, right? Divided our, you know, masculine from our yes. feminine. And that's Aristotelian. Yeah, divided uh, us by language in different places, but also that each culture is dominated by a particular sense is fascinating. Right, right. Yeah, and well, yeah, so what you said is a bunch of places to jump off on. Mm -hmm. um, one is uh one is the is the term imagination and there's a, a couple of different levels of imagination but um if you go to there's a guy named Henri Corbin um who is one of the great esoteric thinkers he was mostly uh in the last century mm -hmm. and um he talked about what the imaginal world and the imaginal world is this sort of barzac this borderline place between sort of pure divinity mm -hmm. and the human aspect of things so or you know the aboriginals it's, it's probably very correlate to dream time um, all those things take place in the imaginal world and one of the things that's been drummed out of us through rational uh thinking is our imagination in fact mm -hmm. that's why the first word of my book is imagine um because i'm trying to reawaken that in a certain sense mm -hmm. and, um so so that's one of the things that's really been missing and and you talk about the program because they replace it with a different kind of imagining so mm -hmm. taking like a hugely imaginative work like the bluebird so that was that was the work for the the world war one generation right, right. The world post World War II generation. It was basically, I think, it's mostly the Wizard of Oz. There are other things, mm. but I think I was just going to ask you what the connection yeah. was between Bluebird and Wizard of Oz, right? Because obviously, there, there, there's shadows and echoes. They're hinting back at one with the song Rainbow because it's you know, and I, I recognize not only is the project called Bluebird, but they actually use bluebirds in the programming because they're trying to push you over the rainbow to where the bluebirds fly, right? So. Like there's all of this, and of course, I, I that's what I come from is the Wizard of Oz programming, right? right so right. yeah, and, and, I, and yeah, the Bluebird is more of um, you know, blue, the Bluebird as far as um, Maurice Meiderlink who wrote the play that mm -hmm. you, uh, came out on, and it's a silent movie that we're talking about, and you can find it um, on YouTube. 
um, um, it's 1918, I believe, that particular version. Um, so again, it's a silent movie. And again, it was started as a play, which again is, is a world of imagination mm -hmm. and where, where the imagination would be fueled. And of course, so what happens in the project, it gets flipped into its opposite, like everything else. Mm -hmm. so instead of attaining memory, which is memory of who you really are originally, yes. which as we know is our inner divinity, right? So instead of connecting with that, you know, they're pulling you away from that, you know, and, and fractionalizing your mind and, and separating you from that and replacing it with, uh, but again, it's because it's the same process. They're replacing it with imagery. They're placing it, you know, uh -huh. with other kinds of imagery. Yeah. And then they're turning the meanings of them on their head. And, hmm. and you're just stuck, you know, you're stuck in this, in this place, you know, and I've not had these experiences. I, you know, luckily for, for Chris and I, we, you know, came in, Wherever we came in and grew up, we were kind of under the radar. You know, I was smart enough to stay away from the altar boys and the and the Jesuit schools as a, as a Catholic. Not smart enough, lucky enough. I, just, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't freaking know what was going on at the time, you know. But I certainly had an intuition not to become an altar boy. But um, so so that's you know so that's kind of a a baseline. So the Wizard of Oz by that time. Um, which which takes a lot of the elements of the bluebird, you know, the the quest motif and defining what's reality. But of course, what's the what's the uh, the end game of the Wizard of Oz? You know, well, it's it's mechanical, really. You know, it's 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 the the guy behind the curtain who's you know who's just right. in the movie. Whereas the the end game of the bluebird is is first of all the highest good in that movie is shown to be the, the love of the mother. Mm -hmm. You know, and the mother in that movie is like the divine mother. And so the love of the mother is the highest good in, in this particular movie, The Bluebird. Yeah. So, um, anyway, I don't know. I said something. <laughs> <laughs> well, a couple of things came up for me. So you talked about the imaginal world, which I haven't heard that term used, imaginal. Right? Mm -hmm. You hear imaginative, imagination, imaginary. Um, and it made me start to think about like, so I have this and I know other people do, but like, so sometimes in your dreams, like you have this place you go that is almost like a place in reality, but there's little pockets that are different or there's like an overlay that's different, right? Is that the imaginal world, right? Is that like, you know, and I go, I can go back there repetitively. Like there's certain dream spaces or scapes. Like sometimes I'm in a dream and it's like, it seems like it's Austin to me because I lived in Austin for a long time, mm -hmm. but there's like areas in the dream place that, like either I don't know if I remember from when I lived in Austin or that I can't access in the waking life, but I do feel like I have some memories that cross over. Same thing with New York, same thing with Los Angeles. Like there's places that I go in the dreams where it's very, just very clear to me that I'm in Los Angeles and I'm even in a certain area of Los Angeles, but this place that I'm at in the dream, I've never been there in real life. And when I go looking for it, I can't quite find it. Like I can almost find it, but I can't quite find it. Man, did uh, I do a show on that one time? Did you talk about that where you visited places? So I've talked on your imaginal well, yeah. radar. So I've talked about a lot of stuff, and sometimes I forget what things I've talked about on air and what things I've talked about. Maybe with Nox Mente, we were both on Nox Mente. Yeah, I, yeah, I was. It may, yeah, I was on Nox Mente for like five hours. I was on the regular show, and then we did like a really long post show. Like we were, I was actually, we were actually the week after you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's actually. Like, you know, and some of this I, I ascribe to like programming because I do, I do think that part of what's happening with projects, and I don't know if it's always been or if this is a more recent discovery, is that they are taking us out of the frequency that is this reality that we recognize. And that's part mm -hmm. of how they're keeping these projects and programs hidden. Mm -hmm. And so I can get to a space now and I'm like, okay, I don't see like the room or the place that I am, but there's a frequency here that is like super weird to me, right? And it's like, it can march me almost right up to where I find where I thought I was, but the building might not be there or something like that. Right, and right. It makes me, so then it goes to stuff like, if you guys ever watched Fringe, like some of the pocket universes that were created or going into right. the other universe. And in fact, what you were just talking about, memory replacement. So like, I'm rewatching Fringe with a friend now who never saw it and who I think has some important things to add to this conversation. And, you know, at one point they steal the Olivia from our world and take her, you know, she gets left right. there. They switch right. the Olivias right. and they yeah. want her to think she's the other Olivia. So they're uh, 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 putting some of Oli the other Olivia's bodily fluids into her and it's and not taking. 
And then all of a sudden it starts to take and her memory starts to get confused. And it's my, and I, my mind just started to think now when we were talking about this is that part of what's happening with vaccines and also with things like blood transfusions, right? Organ and transplants. Organ transplants. And not just, okay, I, to me it makes sense, sure. Like if some guy dies and it's his heart that saves his li your life, it, that, to me that is not a surprising thing that you would have some sort of carryover or connection. But the um, uh, desire that the uh, pharmaceutical and the, you know, tyrannical medical complex has to put things from outside of our body into our body and for a lot of those things to be quote unquote not natural substances but possibly things that are carriers of information mm -hmm. right it's like things that are easy to program or to tag things onto or whatever um so yeah when you were saying when you were talking about the replacement of memory that was making me think of that so before well, I get too far off here, what do you think about that? About well, gonna, is, that uh, is that dream space the imaginal world? Well, I was gonna, I was gonna add. Yes, yeah, what I think happens just occurred to me while you were speaking, is that um, all right? So the imaginal world in, is part of a lot of the, you know, the the, the esoteric traditions like Sufism, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's even within the, you know, the, the Christian esoteric traditions, but that doesn't really come up too much in India. And it, and, it, and you can also say it's it's the land. It's also the area of mythology. Now mythology. Um, one, I, I, the one, the one time I did ayahuasca, uh, the, one of the clear things that came uh, with that experience was that all mythology is always happening now. Mm -hmm. so in that particular uh, experience, I was connected with the imaginal world, which is also the mythological world also. Mm -hmm. And because we've lost that capacity, because even you know, in traditional societies, sitting around the fire telling the stories, you know, lights up that, that capacity, lights up that, that imagination within us. So, that, so that's how I'm using imagination, not, you know, Games of Thrones fantasy shit. I've never um, seen Game of Thrones, so yeah. Um, okay. Uh, we couldn't stomach it. So, 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 so <laughs> yeah, so, so what happens is when you lose that faculty, which is a very human faculty, and, and again, our, one of our connections to the divine, the, the imagined world is a real world where real things happen, and it's, it's basically because this world is not a, you know, a, a real world that extends solidly out in time, but it's a world that's being generated through us. That's mm -hmm. effective, right? Continuously generated through us. So there is no world out there. My car does not exist only as a right. thought in my head, yeah. right? So because that, it can be hacked, messed with, enhanced, mm -hmm. because, it's, because it is coming through us. So that imaginal world is, is part of our, our heritage. And when you lose that connection, it comes in through the back door some way. Mm -hmm. Usually it'll come in through some, in some dark way, or, you know, like you're saying, like, well, you're, it's going to come through in your dreams where your dreams are going to somehow generate a world that's kind of similar to this, but it is imaginal where it's, you know, it's a real dreamscape. And in certain ways, dreams are much more real than this world. Right. So, so that's 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 my thought on 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 as far as you know as far as that goes and and because all of that is is intertwined and interpenetrates this world continuously you know that that also gets back to the synesthesia because all of our senses are also mm -hmm. generated in that same way it's not you know as because you're tuned in you don't you know smell a rose that's out there somewhere you know that rose is rosing you you know, in some, in some sense of the language, right? Yeah. You know? So because all of that is coming from this common source within you, then you can, you know, smell time. You can, you know, see colors, et cetera, et cetera, because, because it all is coming from a common place, you know? So that makes some kind of sense? Yeah. 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 I, go ahead, Chris. And the, and the pre-Socratics used the word common sense in a very different way than we did. Mm -hmm. So I think... Uh, a fair assessment of how we use it is just to like, well, practicality, right? It's right. A pra that's practical. That's just common sense. But the pre-Socratics, those coming before Socrates, they were mystics and they mm -hmm. saw the world in a very different way. And they are the fathers of our spiritual beginnings. Mm -hmm. so they are the fathers of Western civilization. So Empedocles, Parmenides, Zeno, those people they saw common sense 
as all of the senses, as synesthesia, really. As okay. All of the senses ah. activated in concert. So you're taking everything in, and that's a unitive experience. That is not an Aristotelian categor categorization of individual discrete entities. Right. So each discrete entity, entity has its own box. So this speaker at my computer, there it is. It's, it has nothing to do with anything else. Not true. Right. Right. So our yoga teacher, our guru in New York, used to say, a thing in itself does not exist. Mm -hmm. And she would repeat that ad nauseum until you really got it that yeah. everything exists in concert with everything else and it's a dance everything and is everything else everything yes. it's, it's all yeah. if it's one it's one yeah right if everything's one then it's one so and i think go ahead no, so two two things like uh let's start here and then i'll go back to the other one what you were just saying about common sense that makes me wonder because you know, the people who are inverting everything and, and running everything, they use every opportunity as for rituals and magic and whatever. So when we hear politicians repetitively say something like common sense gun, ref gun control or mm -hmm. common sense immigration reform or something like that, are they, are ha they, they understand that people believe, oh yeah, well that's just practical, it makes sense, or whatever. Yeah. but they're yeah. really thinking something else with it. They're talking about a full spectrum experience of something that they're calling that. If they even are aware of that yeah. distinction, they may not even be aware of that distinction. But the people they, who are writing their, their talking points probably are. So the politician themselves may not be, but something may be working right. through them, correct? Right. right. That's, yes, right. that's they, possible. Because it's a trigger word, common sense. You know, well, yeah. you can't go against common you can't sense. can't argue with it. can't argue with common sense. You can't right? argue that. Unless, right. Even though they can't explain to you what is so common sense about it, but they insist on right. saying it over and over and over again. And right. it's kind of like, you know, I don't know if you saw the show that Robert and I did about psychic driving with the mm -hmm. Russiagate and the Trump thing, where it's just if something is repeated enough times, right. you know, it's like it becomes either a drinking game or a mind control program. Yeah. But the same thing with this common sense thing, but that's from what you just described, that's like a very important term that if somebody misunderstands it. Absolutely. Right, it's, yeah. Absolutely. And so by robbing us of our, our history, of, of keeping us ignorant of that, it makes us very malleable. Yeah. Because, you know, the average person can't come back to them and say, you're all wet. You don't know what you're talking about. That's not it common sense. Makes me think of the term practical magic. We think we're being practical. They're practicing magic, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that's why it's so important to educate people and to have initiatory stages in life for young people. Mm -hmm. When you take away the initiatory box of, of those years, like between what, like just pre-adolescence and adolescence, mm -hmm. that's that pivotal time when traditional cultures would send their young people through this initiation. And yeah. sometimes it was actually life-threatening. Mm -hmm. Lives would be lost. It was really, it was a real thing. Mm -hmm. But it brings you starkly into the face of the true, the real. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that has been replaced in our society by, Steve was the one who pointed this out. Um, the military has taken the place of the initiation. Yes. And what it is, it's an anti initiation into a death cult. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it that way, when you see what a meat grinder it is, Yep. And, and the fallout from that is just sickening. Yep. And you say, well, hold on a minute. We need to turn this ship around. We need to have people who are adults in the room actually taking the young ones under their wing and going back to the traditional initiatory, true, sacred process. Okay. Um, so I want to... Where I want to go next is on, is on what you just brought up. But before that, I want to go back to one more thing that we were on before, because mm -hmm. I'm trying to tick off all the things that popped to my mind as we talk here. Good. No, you, you hold them. That's great. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so one more thing about the quote unquote imaginal world and about Tavistock. So when you started talking about the imaginal world, I started immediately thinking of the Duran Duran song, Ordinary World, right? 
and I'm not going to sing for you guys because I'm a terrible singer, but it talks about ha having to find, you know, and if I find, if having to find your way to the ordinary world, and if you, you know, on the way you'll learn to survive and all this kind of stuff. And I think of Duran Duran as one of the most heavy stockian type mm -hmm. of uh, the, the level to which I have come to discover they are involved in not only my mind control issues, but like, you know, their, their music is great. And this is the part that's so difficult to explain to people is yes, their music is great and you can enjoy it and be a fan of it and also recognize what was being woven into it. You know what I mean? I think this whole yes. thing of like good, bad is not going to get, throwing something out with the bathwater or being full flat, totally into it. Neither one of those are going to get us to a place of understanding the complexity with with which this world is, that this world is, right? Because it, like Steve said, it's being generated from inside of us. So there is a piece in all of this that is really important for us to understand. Good, right? And so they talk about the ordinary world and I see them as a complete, the complete uh, creation of, of, of Tavistock or similar elk, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they're calling it an or ordinary world, but if you're from an imagine, imaginal world, this place here needs to seem, it must seem insane. It does seem insane to me, right? So that imaginary word, world, imaginal world is the ordinary world. It's hard to survive here, right? But it just made me, you know, for those of us who really still are able to be in touch with that in any sort of way, existing here, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, the way this 3D world is, is really challenging. So in two, like this song makes sense in two ways. They're inverting it, right? They're calling the imaginal the ordinary, right? And someone's desperately trying to get back to the ordinary instead of desperately trying to get back to the imaginal. But if you're from the imaginal, that is what, that would be what is ordinary. So I think therein, that is the complexity of all these Tavistockian creations, right? <laughs> right, is. right, right. Because they take a real thing and they bastardize it. They yeah. bastardize it. It, it, but they leave just, it, this is the part that's fascinating to me, is mm. they leave just enough of a tiny seed in there for those who are like the true seekers to possibly find their way if they don't drive themselves nuts in the process, right? Like th that little seed, it's, th there's that little spot. I mean, it's tiny, right? It's like the pinhead in a haystack, but it's there. And it's like, you know, yeah. What is this? Well, well, it has to be there. And the reason it has to be there is because, because the, the, the structure is the, the grain of truth. There has to be a grain of truth, because, right? Because, yeah, because there's a structure, so it's a cosmic law. the structure of what they're doing law. and the structure of our reality. In other words, it wouldn't work unless what they were doing is somehow congruent uh, with the sacred structure of reality. Good, good. You can't, okay. You can't overlay it if it's completely foreign, right? right? Okay, I'm just going to mark this with you guys because we're going to get into it in the second hour, but I don't want to lose this because sometimes when I get some of my better ones, right? So this goes to like a crystalline structure and this can go to our discuss discussion of sugar and salt and that being the basis of what everything is kind of built on, right? So I wanted to just mark that with you guys so we don't forget. I don't want to get stuck on that right now because I want to hear the rest of what Steve just had to say and then get back to what Chris was saying. But so back to the structure of what we're, of, of our world. Go ahead, Steve. Right, because and that's why you know sacred geometry is so mm -hmm. is so fascinating and so important to study because it, you know, every tradition relies on it, um, you know, to 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 understand the uh, the structure of moving from from the absolute, right, mm -hmm. which is you know which is unimaginable, into right. into manifestation. Whether it's through the imaginal world, the imaginal world still the dream world, the myth world still has rules and regulations by which it operates. Mm -hmm. Some very, very interesting ones. Get into a little bit of that in, in, in my book. Um, there, but, um, so what are they talking about? So, 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 there's, so, so, there's, so there's that aspect of it. And, um, but the sacred geometry part of it is, is, is gets down to the structure of our experience, right? Mm -hmm. Not the structure of the world out there or the universe or some, some thing, right? Mm -hmm the structure of our experience and that structure as it comes into manifestation is done through as you know particular ratios mm -hmm. uh, particular things the, the, the sound vibration sound vibration which again comes through with certain ratios now those sounds those ratio the sound as you know you can you take a regular note you know and and um and the double or or have the vibration you go an octave up or down and then when you cut in when you cut that octave to make perfect fourths perfect fifths 
other musical notations, they, they use certain whole number ratios, three over four, two over three, things like that. Mm -hmm. and, and so those ratios are at the heart of, of how this whole complexity of existence is structured, whether it's mm -hmm. through sound harmonics or, or light, however you want to put it, the vibration of light, you know, things like that. So it's a really important study, but I guess the point I was trying to make is that the people that manipulate our reality through these particular mechanisms, mm -hmm. you know, they have to know that. And they have, not only have to know that, mm. they have to base their mm. inversions, like, like, you know, the cube. You know, the cube is not some sort of evil thing somewhere, you know, with his, right. you know, with his nasty guy Saturn with horns is, you know, <laughs> with, with crap. You know, the, the cube is a sacred structure. And you put a dome on a cube in, in traditional Islamic and, tr and early Christian cultures and, and other Greek, uh, you know, you are you are connecting heaven and earth. You're squaring the circle. You're squaring mm -hmm. the circle, which is which is you know. So the circle, of course, is an is an absolute design um, of infinity. And it represents. Go ahead. And and then and then the square is the earth element. So you mm -hmm. bring that the celestial and the earthly together in what's called the hieros gamos, the sacred marriage, mm -hmm. the alchemical wedding. Right, like the same, similar to the divine union, right? Like the yeah, kind. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. exactly what it is. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm just saying that that's you know, so everyone's goes up and down the cube, this the cube, that. Well, it's not. It's what, but but now that we've lost our symbolic thinking, which is another form of, of working mm. with the imagination. Mm. Right. They replaced our symbolic thinking with negative symbolic thinking. Let's call it that. I don't know. You know, so the cube is bad. The pyramid is bad. The pyramid right. is one of the most amazing structures on this planet. Yes. You know, there's just so much in the, in the pyramid, um, you know, but now the pyramid's bad because it's been co-opted. Mm -hmm. so, and you can only get away with that if you've kept people in darkness and ignorance. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so to, to I guess to the to the simple point I guess I was trying to make is that is that you have to have a knowledge of those uh, what we call sacred geometry these 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 um, these structures really at the baseline of 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 our of our coming into be continuously it, and and then and then you can then you can mess with it but that's why to your point that there's that little grain in there. Mm -hmm. Because it, because it has to be in there because they can't make something out mm -hmm. of nothing and because they do not have our imaginative skills they right. have only rep rep repetition they can only repeat what we do and 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 fuck it up yeah they, you know they can't I mean that's the archonic that's what archons are that's what archons yeah. do they take what we create and that's why humans are apparently you know I don't I don't have any extraterrestrial experience, but you know that's one of the things apparently why humans are noted in the in the in, in the uh, whatever yes. other places. You know that we have an imagination, that we have creativity more so than any other species. Yeah, and so so and so like these these dark things, they can't do that. They can they can only take what we do. And again, like you said, so, so, but, but, so there is that to be something, and that's our way out all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Which okay. Is why it's crucial to damp it down with drugs and GMOs. Yes, absolutely. So you, you got into a little conversation about sacred geometry, and we're about to go there, but the way I want to, the, the portal through which I want to get there is what Chris had to say about the importance of initiation and spiritual education and, 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 and that kind of thing, not in a religious kind of fashion. And, so what you were talking about with the, the military having replaced all of that, right? And, and even now, like, uh, people are getting their initiation through um, YouTube videos or, right, through, mm -hmm. like, the gurus are on YouTube or whatnot. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like one of the things that's interesting about you guys, I had a conversation with you the other day, and, you know, I'm out here now, and, and uh, I have an unusual group of friends, and we like weird, fringy stuff and whatever, and it sounds like that's kind of the life that you guys have led. You just were a few years ahead of us, right? So you're kind of like, you know, you've been doing this for a long time, but it seems to me like maybe you guys got in on like the last round of where it was kind of, there wasn't so much infiltration as there is now, right? Like everything I do, all of the like unusual things I get into, I have that 
awareness in my head, like, is this the truth or is this another mind control program? Or is this a truth? Not necessarily the truth, but a truth. Or is this another mind control program? Or is this mostly truth with the most devious little seed of mind control hidden in it and whatnot? And, you know, it seems like some of the things that you guys have been able to do, you may be, there was already mind control and infiltration starting then, but it was the exception to the rule. Whereas now something pure and clean is, uh, is the exception to the rule, <laughs> right? It's like kind of been switched. So you guys had a chance to move around more freely and experience some of these living in an ashram and studying sacred geometry and all these kinds of things. And now every opportunity for that, like, you know, it's, it's harder to just go and have a pure experience of that, right? And so mm-hmm. people are in really in need of the, that kind of spiritual education or spiritual immersion or exp- experience or some kind of initiation. But that's where the predators really are now. I mean, they've always hidden there a little bit, but now it's where they really are. So what do we do about that? That's yeah, a I know. really good I know, question. Um, we, were, we were lucky. Yeah, we were lucky. We, were lucky. we spent 10 years. Yeah, you can talk we about We were that. 10 years in a very uh, classically oriented ashram where we learned Sanskrit and we worked with the um, primordial text. It wasn't something, it wasn't something that was written today about but we're mm-hmm. working with the primary text. And um, the brilliance of that particular ashram was that our teachers were also schooled in Western philosophy. Mm-hmm. So we right. learned Western philosophy because we need to know the ground that we're standing on and the filter through which we are seeing this mm-hmm. new philosophy that we're learning, this Eastern philosophy. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're forced to learn the Eastern philosophy because our own traditional philosophy of the West has been sullied mm-hmm. and it's been obscured. And we don't even know it exists. We don't even know, for the most part, that our particular civilization had sacred origin. Mm-hmm. We don't know that as a people. And it goes back to the pre-Socratics. And so this whole trajectory has has made it exceedingly difficult to find anything that's uh, pure and unadulterated. We were very fortunate. So we were in that particular ashram. It was not a live-in ashram, but it might as well have been because, you know, we had so many hours there. Really all we did was eat and sleep and work, you know, outside of it. But most of our other time was there. I actually think that was quite probably part of the brilliance of that ashram was that you didn't live because it seems to be that when everybody's living in the same place, right, and all the time and there is no, you know, when you, when you have your own place, even if you're only at home for the eight or 10 hours overnight, right, it's still time alone with your thoughts, away from the guru, a chance for you two to discuss away from everybody else your thoughts on what has been taught. And so you're still, you still have a chance to be present with the information without the influence of, of the others there or, or, or whatnot. So I actually think that that's probably part of why, hmm. I, that, why maybe you had such a good experience and actually part maybe part of what made that a more ethical uh, mm. kind of situation than some of what we're seeing. Because now a lot of times, if you want to go get some of this education, and I believe a lot of these things, these, these you know, intensives and retreats and learning things and whatever, some of them, the intent is good. Most of the things are good, but it's always go away to this, go to this faraway place, which is not in any way connected to where you normally live mm-hmm. and immerse yourself with only people doing exactly what you're doing for this period of time and then go home and try and integrate that into your life. That's impossible. But you guys were living where you were living. You were oh, still going really to the grocery point. store. You were still exactly. having interactions with people who were outside of that. And you were having time alone away from that together to discuss okay. what you were learning. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you have to embody what you're learning. Right. You have and to you don't embody on that, you know, like the, 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 the famous story of the, I think it's a Chinese, I don't know if it's a Buddhist story, you know, the great teacher on the mountain, everyone goes to him. And one day the emperor, you know, wants to get some wisdom from him. So he reluctantly comes down the mountain. He's on mm-hmm. the way to the emperor's palace, you know, when he gets into the marketplace and somebody pushes him and somebody go, you know, knocks over something and he just gets all pissed off and runs back up to the top of the mountain mm-hmm. because he didn't embody it. He's great. It's great when you're yep. up there, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but, you know, driving, driving around, you know, so yes, yeah, so, so that worked in our favor as far as in being able to body. Um, uh, one of our, the guys uh, teaches there, he's called it circumstantial yoga. Okay, and that's, ah. all, 
And yeah. that's all the line. One of the yeah. one of the definitions great, of great yoga time. in the Bible. I love that. Is yoga is um, um, means in action, karma. Yeah. Um, so you know, so it's circumstantial, and everyone else is just, you know, and now pretty much yoga is. Yeah, I don't know and, enough about it. It's shot, but it's all bliss bunny stuff. Yeah, make no mistake. <laughs> yoga, when when practiced traditionally and classically, is a technology. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, what I loved about it, I had no clue when I started there what I was getting into. Yeah. I said, oh, it's yoga. You know, we'll go for a class. And Steve was taking the classes before I was. And, and he'd come home and he'd have these really interesting things to report. And then finally he said, oh, why don't you come? Um, so what amazed me was the depth and the maturity of it mm -hmm. and the solidity and the grounding principle of it mm -hmm. there was nothing flighty about this particular ashram at all yeah it was definitely rooted in something very ancient yeah and it's the way i began to look at it was that it was like taking human experience and putting it under a microscope uh -huh. so that you could see that like a, like a watchmaker. You ah. could see the tick, 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 yep. tick, tick, tick. Oh, that's how that happens. Oh, that's how that arises. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's how I can work with that. And that's how I can control this particular um, negativity in my life. Or, yeah. But there's a mechanism about it. Well, there's the, the, what I, I mean, I have limited experience with yoga, right? But, but my, under, uh, I kind of, you know, get to see it the way I see everything. And I'm like, okay, well, the West, the, in the West here, it's been turned into bliss, bunny, unicorn, magical, whatever, or it's been turned into a uh, gymnastics -y exercise, right. stretchy, something you do to get a great body, yoga. right? I don't, I don't need it for that. I do other, I, I like to do the exercise where I'm running around and jumping around. So for me, Okay, it comes down to, I see what I'm doing. I'm making sacred geometry shapes with my body mm -hmm. that is providing path, you know, sort of a tunnel or a path for the, what we're talking about, the divine union, or, you know what I mean, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's just simple. It's like, you know, for, when I dance, it's different. It's with music and whatever. But again, that is for me, the sacred geometry of the movement is what's bringing the spiritual sort of stuff for me. But the same with the yoga. It's like, okay, I make this shape with my body and I'm able to, you know, have better control over this energy in my body or this element of my body or be able to see it. So it is a technology. It's a very, you're right. It's a primitive. It's a very ancient yeah. Yeah. technology. Uh, yeah. And, and actually the yoga, the, uh, yoga postures, the asanas, mm -hmm. are not to exercise your body. They're to quiet your body. They're to release whatever mm -hmm. is stuck. Yep, stuck it's in like, it. It's like a form of acupuncture, acupressure, really. Yeah. To release yeah. what's stuck so that you can sit in meditation. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it comes before meditation. Yes. And the, the seven meditation limbs, happens seven after limbs. the yoga. Yeah. Right? There's, so there are seven limbs of yoga. And, and, and the asanas are just one limb, but they're right. on the way. They, they are a purposeful activity yeah. with a teleological purpose. So they yeah. have an end in mind. And the end in mind is to sit in meditation so that you can have, it's you can realize the real. Body, the highest. Yeah. Unit of yeah. experience, the unit of experience, samadhi is the highest for that. And, oh. you know, right. yeah, and just, just to, to, to tie a bow on that, you know, but for me anyway, um, oh, I just want to mention too, I, I used to follow the Grateful Dead and do sacred dancing. To that. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't call it that then. I just call it this crazy shit. But um, <laughs> so, uh, but, but, to tie, but in the end, uh, at least I felt, and I'm, and I'm sure Chris did to a certain extent, that, you know, here we are, but we're, you know, I'm, I'm saying namaste, but I'm not a Hindu, you know, I'm right. going through all these, these sort of motions, and I've imported this technology because I had to, because there was nothing yeah. we have access to. And even though we did study these pre-Socratics, and we had an understanding of, uh, you know, of that, that there was a sacred origin here, it wasn't fully fleshed out. And you know, once we left, we were able to work with that first through the sacred geometry, which mm -hmm. which is behind everything, and then through a study of uh, of you know, for me especially with the Greek tradition, and that's you know, kind of where my book comes from. Yeah, yeah. I just started read a couple of pages in your book the other day when I got it, and I'm excited to to sort of get into it. But 
I, this is where I kind of want to go is into a little bit of a, you know, you know, not, not a long one. Maybe we'll sometime have another show or a segment or something interesting, just more specifically about the technicals of sacred geometry and whatnot. But, you know, I, one of the things I do think is both, uh, universal so not necessarily unique to western culture right you find it the sacred geometry in every culture is in slightly different forms but you could recognize you could recognize it in all these different you know ancient cultures but it is definitely a basis of western culture you find it at the base of all of the buildings at the base of the diagrams of the cities at the everything and for me i've never been a uh, religious person i was raised without religion and mm -hmm. The first thing and still the thing I that kind of comes to me the most when I'm trying to understand uh, how the world works and you know why and all that kind of stuff is the sacred geometry. But when I, you know, I first started experiencing it in my own mind, right? And then I started to go looking for what that was and oh, okay, this is this thing called sacred geometry, right? And I started, I wanted to learn more about it. And I so I just like everybody does when they realize there's a God or when they have some sort of spiritual thing, they go to look for a teacher or a church to join or a study group or whatever. And what I found was um, that at this point, there's, it's really hard to find a good, clean, healthy source of information on sacred geometry that can, because sacred geometry is interesting. It's like any other relationship with God or universe. It's, mm -hmm. there's some things you should know, but then it's about the way you perceive them and how, what, how you use it and your interaction with it and whatnot. And I found that like almost every, every, person that you could find that was teaching it out there on the internet, your Dron Velos, your Dan Winters, you know, Randall Carlson, there was something, something mm -hmm. there that like, eh, that doesn't really um, ring true for me, or there's some icky thing I feel like is being piggybacked on here. And then probably, you know, so I just kind of always just followed my own path with it. And I, you know, there's probably some things that I don't know that I need to know and other things that come naturally to me that maybe I understand that some people don't. Um, but I started to become extremely concerned when it started to see, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. It seems like there's become a cult of sacred geometry, right? Like it is part of the religion for the burning man generation. Yes. Right? Mm. And what I find concerning about it is it seems to be a closed system based on sigil magic, right? It's not an open expanse of hyperspace kind of system. The, the, the things that they're focused on seem to be, um, I don't know. I see it as a closed system. Acquisition. Huh? Acquisitions, like what Acquisition. can I this? How can I manifest? Yeah, it is, using yeah, it for things like the secret. Fast. Using it for things that, like, like yeah, that movie, The Secret. Like, I, I remember a person who was when I was looking for some spiritual education. I took a meditation course from somebody who was considered an elder in the dance music community, right? And the whole experience was repulsive for me on a, a number of different levels. I actually, by the end, thought that it was dangerous and I didn't even attend the last class, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But he thought the movie The Secret was great because he had been using meditation mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, Buddhism and, and you know, so, uh, some of these other, you know, kinds of things, other spiritual traditions to manifest stuff, and right? It's like, right to manifest and you know and, and you know there was some other icky stuff overlaid over it but this is what is out there and so i do think that for people who are of a certain sort of mm, the new creative class your burning man class who are equally educated in technology and creation of art and and, and stuff like that they're being mm, while it's great that they're looking towards sacred geometry it's kind of like uh, Scientology for the Burning Man community kind of thing, right? Or something yeah. like that would be the best that I could, you know, there's something wrong here. There's something, is, yeah. yeah, shy away dark. anything that big and monstrous and, and, and untamed. And trendy. It, yeah, and trendy. trendy. And, you know, and so I love, I'm both equally attracted to all the sacred geometry stuff and, you know, I'm cautious about it, right? Like I'm cautious about any, Thing that isn't coming from my own personal experience and then because of my history i'm even cautious about some of that stuff so nice. you guys seem to be able to you seem to have you know gotten into sacred geometry before there was this yeah. you know yeah. sort yeah. of trend and maybe got a, a cleaner education at it so can we you just kind of, can you, uh, what yeah so we were we, we were kind of lucky in that because it was about when we started moving down here which was 
uh, exactly 20 years 20 ago. 20 years ago. 20 years ago this month or yeah. something like that, we moved to from New York to Asheville, I should not assume. Yeah. So can you just kind of give us a primer and maybe we'll have a special that is really just on sacred geometry sometimes that would about be good. Um, why, why it is so important, why it is such a, a part of our sacred origins? in the West, not just our sacred, sacred origins as oh, a universe. It's human origins. It's, human, yeah. it's humanity. But also it's part of the West, yeah. Yeah. You know, but not, not, not exclusive to. We, you no, know, no. we could do a whole intro show of just, you know, sort of the pure form sacred geometry, which is just, you know, drawing. You know, just drawing, yeah. the, the, starting with the circle and then, and then what comes out of the circle right. and, and the vesica Pisces and all that stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but, you know, unfortunately, you're right, you know, when people like, you know, somebody like Drumbelo, I consider him at best a great magician, uh, you know, uh -huh. someone who's someone who, who manipulates this stuff for some sort of purpose, and I don't know what it is. Uh, James Twyman, there are a bunch of these guys out there that, that just when we were starting too, you know, and everybody was jumping up and down about him. And then, you know, I read the book and I'm like, you know, this guy is, 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 mis is really misleading people. I have to say, I had the weird, I had the weirdest experience with the Drunvalo stuff, right? And I don't know how. Maybe this goes to my synesthesia, but I watched about two and a half hours of him on video, and in the two, you know, for like like a ten or a twelve hour series, and two and a half hours in, he had not yet even begun to speak about anything that I recognize as having anything to do with sacred geometry. Mm -hmm. But what I kept feeling like was. You know, when you were a kid and there'd be like the weird man with the van that has like the glass window, the window <laughs> and the wood paneling. Like I felt I was being groomed for the eventual molestation. Oh, right? was, this is a trick. And that could be your background yeah. alerted you to that. Yeah. 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 Trick. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah, then, yeah, then we had people who spent, you know, ridiculous amounts of money to see him. Mm -hmm. and, they, and, they're, and, and they were just come out and they all as a person came to us and said, oh, Drumvalo's coming from the heart now. And have we lost you, Emily? Oh, uh-oh, you blinked out. We're frozen. She's gone. Emily, what happened? We messed with Drumvalo. Huh. <laughs> okay, guys, welcome back. We just experienced the gremlins of, of Zoom as soon as we started speaking about sacred geometry in a certain way. Oh, I thought you were gonna say the gremlins of Zeus. <laughs> It might be the gremlins of Zeus. <laughs> yeah, that's a band. Right? So the same thing happened on the show with Jeff a few weeks ago. I've never had problems with, uh, with Zoom before until, you know, we got into an interesting topic as well and started talking about something in a slightly different way than it is normally talked about and even the alternative media. But uh, so we're going to try and pick up. I don't know exactly what got recorded and what didn't, and I won't know until it renders. But, you know, we were just talking about uh, the – geometry and some of the teachers of it and this remindful experience that I had of sort of some kind of sexual abuse almost and you know I've brought this up with other people a few mm. times but you guys have some more knowledge than, than most about sacred geometry and that is when I first started going through like what I would call like the really deep deep programming right and I started to really access some stuff that I had had been sort of off limits to my memory before uh, I had this experience where my chakras began to spin in a way that was very uncomfortable to me. And I was literally feeling uh, like if I closed my eyes, but even it almost bled over into my eyes being open, geometry is coming up off of me, right? Mm -hmm. And it led me to the insight that I've talked about with a few people, a few others, uh, in that they actually use sacred geometry to lay down some of the mapping of the mind control programs not just in your brain, but actually in your chakra points. The, sto right. the, 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 the map of the mind control program is, is laid down in the chakra points. Talk yeah. about intrusive. Yeah, there is a, and there is a particular uh, shape and geometry associated with each, with each chakra. Yeah. So, so, you know, so yeah, so they can be manipulated. And there's also a sense with that, that's hooked up. So, you know, once I was sitting, on, I was sitting on a bench once, so mm -hmm. I had to take a bicycle ride a number of years ago, back when we were living on Long Island. And I was just stopped in, in a park and I was just sitting on the bench and it was just absolutely perfectly clear and natural to me that I was seeing through my third chakra. Uh-huh. Yep. My navel. That that and that and then I went and rechecked and that's that's the uh, the chakra that's associated with sight. 
Yeah. So actually, there, that's where your site is not organized in your brain, but it's organized in, in your chakras. Gut. Thus, you can use the sacred geometry of those chakras to yes. mess with your sensorium. Yeah, to mess with the gut. Bio. To mess with that, to mess to mess with all sorts of stuff, it, you know. Like, it, it, but it's also like each person with, through their programming. There's some stuff that everyone's run through, but then there's programs that are particular to them, and that almost at, the the geometry is almost like a diagram of that, right? Mm -hmm. Like in certain ways, like areas that certain information is stored in this point of the map or that point. That, you know what I mean? Like different, like the treasure hunt map, right? Kind of thing. And as I started to work through that, like I started to understand how it works. So there's that part of it. But then there's also, you know, the geometry can act as a portal. And a lot of times these entities yes. and energies that like to come in, they like to come in through our chakra points. And all they have to do is line their geometry up with yours. And it's like a key going into a door. Mm -mm -mm. Right? Goodness. Yeah, it all sounds right to me. I mean. Yeah. And then come through. So it's interesting you know, so I, it, think about it. It would be it would be advantageous for people who are trying to manipulate things to sort of twist slightly people's understanding of the geometries so that they can't use them in the way they want, but they can be accessed because they're open to it, right? Right, right. And, and so, so the counter to that then would be like the traditional practice of chanting the the seed sounds of each. Mm -hmm. Chakra. So the, uh, from the lowest to the to the highest, it's lum, vum, rum, yum, hum, and then om at the so ajna cool. chakra, right? And 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 I'm and, smiling because a friend and I have been doing this. So yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I and I still do this. That would be so. That would keep your chakras vibrating with with let's say you know the correct vibration mm -hmm. that would be um, inimical to to other forces coming in mm -hmm. and and doing something with it. Whereas on the other hand, if you are you know, engaging in activities, say on a lower chakra level, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, um, you know, uh, listening to, you know, certain musicians and things like that, that are uh, the, the little, you know, pop girl things, the stuff that we hear in the gym that, that, that just got, kind of makes you really wretch. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are the things that are designed to yeah. throw off your chakras and to make them, yeah, portals, if you will. Totally. To, other things you know so that's why you you know that's but you know like you're saying it's this is this is the time we live in and, it, and you know frankly it sucks we have we you know everything is manipulated everything is broken every you know every <laughs> sacred every thing, thing has been torn apart ripped apart and 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 just turn on on its head but the the kernel the little seed of what's good is that um, in this time i get to have conversations with you who live right. on the other side of the country and in a time that was different than this that didn't have all this bullshit right we at least get to have a mostly unintruded upon conversation everyone might be listening right? right and we had a little disruption so there is that seed that kernel that of something to expand from you know buried within it so and you know what that is hmm. that's homeopathy yeah Woo! yes it is right the vibrations out from the little tiny yeah that's so homeopathy that leads us, I think, really nicely into where we're going to go in the next segment. So uh, we're going to tie a bow on this part, and we've already taken our imposed break, the Zoom imposed break. So we're going to wrap this segment up and end it and then start the next segment. But before we go and move over to the Patreon side, and guys, if you haven't joined us yet over on Patreon, please do. Uh, in addition to uh, getting the exclusive content, we also have really interesting uh, group chats, which is where I got to know Chris and Steve. And you can support us at patreon.com forward slash media. We'd love to see See you over there before we we wind this up though where if people would like to interact with you or know more about you guys steve right. where can they find your book how can they interact right with you? so we're, we have a publishing company we have about 15 wonderful books on on the site wow. uh the publishing company is called logo sophia books um and it's l-o-g-o-s-o-p-h-i-a-b-o-o-k-s um dot com and um, and someday we can talk about how uh, how I designed the uh, the logo for Logo Sophia books as as a sacred geometry. Um, yes, I, I was very intrigued with it when it came to me in the mail. I had a I had a vision based around it, so that was kind of interesting. Um, yeah. And and so and then also on the, any of you who, are, who who follow Robert Phoenix's show, we are generally the first Friday of the month mm -hmm. uh, on his Friday forecast, and we usually come up with um you know with with something different for each show with something weird to talk about it's always weird yeah. with robert so you know uh, we, yeah, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> last last week last friday we did a garden tour which was yeah. really, 
well received. A lot of people like that. So anyway, so that's where we're found mostly, um, you know, and uh, and yeah. So there's you know on the on the website is contact information, you know, or email, all that sort and of stuff. And Loco Sofia's motto is beauty is not a luxury, it is a necessity. I couldn't agree more. And maybe we'll have a sacred course in sacred geometry with you guys at some point. Maybe we'll have a little series or something where we can go through some of it and any of the weird stuff that comes up in terms of things that I have thought or taught or been programmed with about that we can kind of go through because I'm sure I, the reason I share so much for drop myself is not because I think that my life or my story is any more special and important than anyone else's but it's the only thing that I know and what I do know is that there's other people out there that contact me and say oh I thought I was crazy until I heard you talk about that mm -hmm. right so some of these things that may come up as we work through some of the basics of sacred geometry would be interesting for people to to sort of know about so we'll have to do that all right guys that wraps up the, the right. public hour we will see you on the other side. You guys stay right there. I'm going to stop this recording. Bye, guys. Bye. All right. So. You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com.